are claims that GCSEs are getting easier and some employers will not rate them. But these have been rejected by the exam boards. Well, they're not easy to pass. The standards are being judged by Ofsted, they've been judged by the regulation authorities, they've been judged by the awarding bodies and comparability studies, and have shown for over 20 years to be consistent, reliable and rigorous. The all-important league tables are calculated on the number of C grades and above gained by a school. Critics say because of this, less able candidates can be neglected by teachers. It's inevitable that perhaps uh, attention isn't even given at all times to the youngsters who are not performing at that level. But that, I repeat, is an inevitable consequence of the emphasis on league tables. Thousands are today planning their next level of education, but there are others leaving school after 11 years with no qualifications. Annabel Roberts, ITN. Today's GCSE results come at a time when many head teachers are calling for the whole system of the GCSEs to be changed. John Dunford, General Secretary of the Secondary Heads Association, joins us now from our central London studio. First of all, why do you think that students are doing better? Is it because exams are getting easier? It's certainly not because exams are getting easier. Repeated attempts have been um, made by people to, to, to claim that, uh, and all the inquiries that have been carried out suggests that the standard of examinations, as Dr. McClone said just now, have been maintained uh, over many years. Of course, the exams have changed. They're a different kind of exam, which re re reflect a different kind of syllabus. But at least the standards, we can be sure, are being maintained. But also today, there is a growing number of students who haven't got any passes at all. Do you think that this system is polarising students at the top and the bottom of the scale? I think it is to a certain extent, but I think there are other reasons for that. Uh, at the bottom end of the scale, there are now available uh, certificates of achievement uh, which can be used, which can be taken by uh, children who would find the GCSEs too difficult. And, and they, I think, have uh, dropped out of the GCSE system. Um, but I think that the pressure, all the pressure on schools that comes from league tables comes at the grade C, D borderline to, because the, the benchmark by which schools are judged is the proportion of children who get five uh, A to C grades. And what we would much rather see is um, a, a benchmark which reflected improvements in overall uh, performance of children right from the top to the bottom. Something like the average point score, uh, which we have uh, uh, as an A-level benchmark. Mr Dunford, thank you very much. Thank you. It's emerged today that there's been a sharp rise in the number of people having to queue to get themselves onto a hospital waiting list. Nearly half a million people now have to wait more than three months just to see a doctor before then being referred to another waiting list for treatment. Lauren Taylor explains. Since it came to power, the government has been trying to get waiting lists for operations down. And now it has another problem. Today's figures show that people are now waiting longer to see a specialist after being referred by a GP. Overall outpatient waiting lists in England rose between April and June. The number of people waiting 13 weeks or more for a hospital appointment was up by 29,000 to 485,000, although those waiting more than 26 weeks fell by 7,000 to 146,000. The Department of Health says 78% of patients do see a consultant within 13 weeks and 94% within 26 weeks. The opposition parties argue that it's the government's emphasis on reducing inpatient waiting lists that's led to a rise in the outpatient queues, and the £30 million being spent on the problem isn't enough. £30 million is grossly inadequate in the health service to deal with what is a huge backlog of cases that the government have deliberately created in order to stop people getting onto waiting lists. What we're actually finding here is that the government are distorting clinical priorities. They're taking minor operations and putting them up the list try and get the waiting list down and keeping people waiting for serious operations even longer. The ministers insist they are determined to reduce outpatient waiting times. The average time that somebody has been on a list has gone up by a few days from just over six weeks to nearly seven and that has its effect on long waiters. So we're going to apply the same determination to getting down the outpatient waiting list and times that we have so successfully done for inpatients. The government argues that the extra £30 million being put into tackling outpatient waiting lists will make a difference. But the opposition parties are equally adamant that it won't be enough to solve a problem which they say the government itself has made worse. Lauren Taylor, ITN, Westminster. Two parents are to learn in a high court whether social workers can force them to test their baby for HIV. Camden Council in London wants to test the baby because its mother is HIV positive, but the parents are refusing. 
It's been seen as a landmark case for the rights of parents to make decisions about their children's health. And Tim Wilcox is at the High Court. Uh, Tim, tell us a bit more about this case. Well, John, the case is being heard in private in the family division of the High Court, and the family involved cannot be named for legal reasons. What we can report on, though, is that the case concerns the four-month-old baby daughter of an HIV-positive mother. Now, Camden Council, which has brought the case, wants the child to be tested for the virus, arguing that HIV is a deadly infection which could eventually kill the little girl. The little girl's parents, however, who practice alternative health care, have so far refused to let the test go ahead. They say that mother and daughter are perfectly healthy. Indeed, the mother who tested positive in 1990 has said that in the intervening nine years she's had no major health care problems whatsoever. Well, it does raise major issues about parents' rights, this case, doesn't it? Well, it does, as you say. The implications are enormous, um, centering on the rights of parents and the rights of the child. The judge will have to decide, after listening to medical evidence on both sides, um, what is in the best interest of the child. Uh, whether to let the test go ahead, and if the test is positive, to put that child through drug treatment, which could keep her well, or let the parents continue with their own philosophy. There's also the other issue, that the mother continues to breastfeed the child. Now, recent research in America uh, suggests that children born to HIV-positive mothers had a 1 in 10 chance of becoming infected. So people here are asking, what happens if the judge decides to test the child, the test is found to be negative, but the mother continues to want to breastfeed her child. Complicated. Thank you, Tim. At least three people have been killed in serious violence in the capital of East Timor. There have been running battles in the streets between militiamen and rival gangs opposed to next week's ballots on independence. Those who want autonomy for the province are threatening to start a civil war if their cause is defeated. Here, the beleaguered child support agency is under fire this morning yet again. An independent watchdog has claimed there's been little or no improvement since last year. It said the agency was still plagued by delay and poor communication. The report also highlights new areas for concern, like the way disputes are handled between parents over custody of their children. An investigation by ITV's flagship current affairs programme tonight with Trevor MacDonald has found evidence that British soldiers were exposed to dangerous levels of radiation during the Gulf War. The reporter, Michael Nicholson, also found that they weren't warned of the risks. Our defence correspondent, Kevin Dunn, has more details. For the first time in the Gulf War, American and British forces used new armour-piercing shells the troops called their magic bullets. They contain depleted uranium, which once detonated leaves a radioactive and highly toxic dust. Some Gulf War veterans, like Ray Bristow, believe exposure to depleted uranium may be one cause of their Gulf War illnesses. I see my future now as uh, just sitting on death row uh, with depleted uranium poisoning. Um, uh, you, you may survive quite a long time, you may die very quickly. The Ministry of Defence rushed new tank shells containing depleted uranium into production in the Gulf War, but did not warn soldiers of the risks. We need a basic understanding of depleted uranium hazards. This American Army video, obtained by the Tonight Programme, has been made since the Gulf War. A former serviceman who helped make it was himself contaminated. Oh, they measured it some years ago, three years after the fact, that 5,000 times beyond a permissible level. 5,000 times. Correct. The government admits some British troops may have been exposed to depleted uranium, but says they were very few and the risks very small. Kevin Dunn, ITN.